for joining us. Uh, I'm Devanya Karavi. I'm the Associate Director of Electric Mobility and Integrated Transport at WRI India. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to this session on institutional governance uh, frameworks for mobility action. I give a brief opening address, and then I'll hand over to Dr. Bhagde for his keynote remarks. And then we'll have a short presentation by Diksha Chaudhary. And then we will have the uh, panel discussion with how the scheme factors. So that's the floor of the discussion. And, uh, I'll get started without any further ado. So over the past few years, the e-mobility transition has really started taking off. And we all know that, I think, in this room, that uh, e-mobility today, at least in 2023, uh, EVs have reached 6.5% uh, more share of registrations. And at the state level, in certain states like Goa, Chandigarh, Tripura, Delhi, yeah. we're actually having at 11% EV adoption. And even large states like Karnataka, Uttar Pradesh, across 8 and 9%. So this puts us in a good position as we aim to start achieving the 30% by 2030 goal for uh, EV transition. However, there are still several hurdles that remain. These include the uneven proliferation of EV charging networks, the fragmented ecosystem for EV battery recycling, the seamless disbursement of incentives for EVs to remain the challenge in some places. Uh, all of these create roadblocks in accelerating the transition further. And many of these roadblocks or challenges are caused due to the multiple stakeholders that are involved in the e-mobility ecosystem. And the, given that the sector is still one in which government and private sector stakeholders are learning, there's a lack of coordination and technical capacity sometimes, uh, be it having standard contract templates and PPP models. Uh, or having institutions or departments responsible for e-mobility, coordinated e-mobility actions within discoms or municipal governments. Many such issues. So as we enter the scale-up stage of growth for the EV ecosystem, it is critical to maintain this momentum, otherwise there is a risk of plateauing at this point. And today's discussion aims to shed light on some of these institutional and governance challenges in the e-mobility sector, and some of the best practices that states, local bodies, and civil society organizations are instituting to create that enabling ecosystem. We are uh, very happy to be joined by a few states here and by the uh, Dr. Valde, who represents NOMA, to actually understand some of these institutions that states are creating. And we have some civil society partners as well who are going to speak about some of their initiatives with states that might help uh, improve coordination between public and private sector and improve capacity uh, at the government level. So this discussion is being held under the aegis of the Forum for Decarbonizing Transport, which is an ETIO led platform for fostering discussions towards ambitious transport decarbonization action. The Forum for Decarbonizing Transport is part of the NTC Transport Initiative for Asia, a multi-year, multi-partner initiative that promotes transport decarbonization in fast-growing countries like India, Vietnam, and China. The NCTI program is part of the International Climate Initiative, which is working under the leadership of the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action, in close cooperation with the Federal Ministry of Environment and the Federal Foreign Office of the Federal Republic of Germany. I thank the Institute of Urban Transport under the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs for organizing Urban Mobility India 2023 and giving us a platform for having this important discussion. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Surendra Kumar Bhatte, the additional secretary of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, and the figurehead behind the PM Uber Seva scheme to give the keynote for this session. So it would be an honor to hear from you on the EBUS ecosystem in the country and the institutional and coordination mechanisms that underlie the deployment of such an ambitious initiative as such as the one that you're heading right now. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I go like uh, one of the uh, presentations and follow because uh, uh, I think it's better to have a interaction rather than a keynote. Uh, you know, like uh, uh, we would like to see how uh, what states are doing and uh, what mechanisms can uh, actually work and what are the challenges. And since we are at the beginning, beginning of the scheme, which involves uh, drafting a right kind of uh, contract. And uh, getting it uh, through the process and implementing. 
So I think what are the presentation after this? There is one presentation, sir, and then we'll be speaking to the states and the partners on the different initiatives. We also have KSRTC represented here. We have the Delhi um, Transport Department represented here. So we can speak to some of the specific initiatives at the state level. Yeah. Um, and, but uh, the one presentation is on general uh, institutional coordination mechanisms in across e mobility, not just e buses, but one specific focus on e buses as well. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me for this session and um, uh, sorry for uh, delay because of the maze around this place in terms of the road network. And uh, so I see many faces uh, which uh, I had seen in the uh, past couple of uh, years uh, uh, during my stint in uh, Mumbai. And um, uh, you know, like we've been working on the scheme for quite some time, but uh, uh, we issued guidelines in the month of uh, August and uh, we also got uh, some head start in terms of proposals from the state and uh, you know like we are now uh, with the help of from CSN we are in the stage where we can uh, go to the market and publicly announce our intention of uh, putting us on the ground. So I think uh, uh, e-bus is uh, uh, it's uh, like uh, it's not a new thing in the sense running buses is important and uh, uh, earlier uh, those uh, cities and states they were running buses uh, uh, if you look at history they were uh, diesel buses and uh, actually before diesel buses some of the buses were electric a long back that uh, uh, actually BST uh, started its journey in 1878 and uh, I had a chance to see one of the very small like uh, nowadays we are talking of 9 meter bus, uh, 7 meter bus, 20 seater so I think uh, one of the earliest bus there was uh, less than 7 meter or maybe around 7 meter and I was told that it used to be uh, operated by some, uh, you know, like earlier actually there were electric buses and then the uh, fuel uh, board changes change. So we had uh, cities have been uh, experience, uh, experiencing uh, the different fuel modes. So one, the cities have been providing transport services. Fuel mode has kept changing. So uh, diesel came. Uh, after diesel, we saw okay, CNG has certain advantages in terms of. Uh, uh, you know, pursued uh, benefit and the uh, real benefit of uh, clean fuel, uh, uh, various pollutants uh, which are emitted, uh, there is a reduction in uh, those pollutants and then we adopted uh, CNG. So, cities uh, have been uh, in bus services, fuel mode has been changed. And then now the turn has come for the electric buses. Uh, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, there are many people who know it, but I'm just trying to put in context what actually electric bus means. So if you look at uh, operating buses, uh, diesel buses or CNG versus electric buses, uh, there are a uh, few major differences. One, you know, so-called uh, uh, range anxiety. And actually, earlier, uh, when people used to say range anxiety, I, I thought that the word anxiety did not come along, but I am realizing more and more that anxiety may be better for you. So, you know, like, so uh, when you run electric buses, uh, uh, if you uh, say CNG or diesel bus, you put uh, fuel inside the bus and you forget for the day. Like, you run it for uh, 10 hours, 200 kilometers, you don't have to worry. The depot managers, I think uh, while we are designing the scheme, uh, we forget about the person who is actually running the bus. Running the bus doesn't mean the person who is driving the bus. So, you know, uh, we never paid attention to these minor technical differences, but running is very different from driving the bus. So, the person who is running the bus is the depot manager and not the MD and uh, GM, whatever you call it. So the person who is running the buses, he is really having an anxiety. And so what is happening, going to happen to my schedule and trips and all that. So I think those concerns uh, seems to be very prominent when we come to the electric buses. Because the, there is a capacity, uh, there is a capacity constraint in terms of how much fuel you can put inside uh, the bus. And uh, so that is limited by what can be the battery, what can be the battery chemistry, how much charging time, fast charging, slow charging, and charging having the impact on the life of the battery and performance. So these things are new for the cities which are operating buses. 
So this transition is what I think is uh, very important to uh, manage, to understand. And if we are able to manage this transition uh, from uh, a mode where uh, the person who was learning bus service did not bother about all these parameters. And these parameters have to be in his mind constantly because of the issues of range or, uh, you know. Furthermore, uh, if you look at the depot, uh, there used to be a big tank under the depot for fuel. And now you require a very big uh, uh, electric substation. That substation suddenly requires power all the time, uh, if not in the daytime, but uh, reliable power. Uh, in uh, diesel and CNG, reliability is at least for a few days is ensured because you have been tanked. You fill the fuel and then you forget not only about the bus but about the tank also. Here, every day you have to fill the tank, which is uh, having the power available at the charging places. And if you have a uh, need for opportunity charging, uh, then I think uh, 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 there is a need for uh, continuously making that power available at different uh, places uh, in the city. So I think. Uh, if we understand these differences, then we can not only think about, uh, I think those cities, uh, this institutional and uh, governance framework uh, is there. And many cities have either, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, most of the uh, cities where bus uh, are working, they either have a city themselves, municipal corporation operating services, or they have set up uh, uh, you know, special purpose vehicle or some other company. So, institutional framework has evolved in many cities. Uh, it's evolving. But I think for electric buses, uh, the institutional framework along with this techno uh, technological challenges and uh, peculiarities of uh, this service, I think they need to be managed and if required, we, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you all the uh, uh, system wherein these challenges can be uh, assessed continuously and these problems address online uh, on continuous basis. Now, the old institutional framework in terms of uh, uh, one, uh, you know, like uh, having to report in the morning and then again uh, report in the evening. Now, that plus having a routes, you don't worry about where you're going to opportunity charge and all that. So, the attitude and involvement of management and the design of the uh, uh, system is uh, has to undergo change, and that change has to address these issues of how we are going to manage, uh, you know, uh, these buses with these uh, peculiarities and these challenges. And I think that requires a lot of focus on technology and right uh, uh, framework for measurement of what things matter. And uh, so the point is, I think I now realize that uh, when we are designing contracts and when we are bringing services, we are bringing services and we are trying to see that electric bus is a replacement for CLG or diesel. Bus. It's not like that. The whole mindset has to change and that mindset change and I think that's what uh, is very important uh, that we have to understand this and then work for change of mindset. If it's a constraint that I can't put uh, fuel for the entire day, then how am I going to manage? Uh, if I have to take my bus every time uh, to depot for say a portable charge, then it is, is it good use of public money and resources? If not, how do I create uh, you know like a network of charging stations? So uh, I think many times I realize that it's a, a network optimization with uh, these constraints, and so skills are very different. Uh, skills are very different. Uh, the governance structure will evolve, but uh, these problems have to be uh, incorporated into our. Uh, whatever uh, you know, contenting mechanism. Furthermore, earlier we used to procure bus and then run. Now, so called uh, loss cost contract or uh, you know, like uh, drive in, wait in, whatever is for. Uh, basically, nobody is buying the bus, everybody is looking for uh, paying as you go basis, like transport as a service or whatever model you call it. And 
So then there is uh, so there is very elaborate contract uh, in terms of what they will deliver, what we are going to consume. But that the measurement framework has not evolved, and because the measurement framework has not evolved, which is acceptable to both to the supplier of service and the one who is receiving service. I think that there are many challenges, the disputes. So the institution uh, has to evolve in a manner where there is going to be more and more reliance on the technology. And then uh, we have you know things like IPMS and all that. And there are so many uh, you know uh, inner workings which are not understood. And uh, when you uh, when you say that okay, I will pay through IPMS kilometers. And eventually you have to pay. Is it possible to pay? And once you start paying, is it going to lead to more dispute or less dispute? Maybe more dispute. I don't know. So you know, like so, I think uh, I will not. Uh, I didn't talk. Uh, you know, like uh, this has been a sector I've been working, but I think we need to uh, pay attention to uh, these factors. And then uh, I don't want to use that uh, word of re-engineering and redesign, but. Look at see what these things are uh, important, valuable for a new service, and then what kind of uh, system we design, or uh, uh, where there is a lot of focus on technology, and then the measurement, which is transfer. What I'm measuring is also known to the person who is providing service, and he can see. You know, there has to be complete transparency in terms of what uh, what is being measured, and for what purpose it is being measured. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, uh, it leads to a lot of dispute. Given the level of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, patchy nature of uh, uh, GPS uh, signals availability and uh, so many things. So I think so uh, through peer peers, we are working with cities, and these cities have already experience. Like uh, Nagpur is interested. Nagpur is already running buses. They have a system. They have. Uh, 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 you know, automatic fare collection system, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, you know they have ITMS. But is ITMS geared towards uh, these things? Can my ITMS tell me when to charge, how much to, to charge, what trips can work, and uh, uh, can I, can it be done automatically without much human intervention? So I think uh, uh, that will be uh, very important. I think the last point I want to mention, as we have seen in urban uh, transport, uh, the number of buses on road, uh, uh, including uh, all the major cities and all that, that has not seen much increase. Rather, it is a very flat curve. And with this scheme, uh, EMB bus uh, scheme, we would like that uh, to have a upward slope. So, uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the biggest factor has been the cost. You know, cost of providing service. And uh, uh, so, GCC or whatever uh, mechanisms we are trying to address that. But but fair collection mechanisms can also uh, potentially save some money. And uh, designing right fair collection uh, <coughs> system, uh, including passenger counter, whatever uh, technology you bring. I think that also has to play a very important role. And then the institutions have to accept that human being may not be there to collect fair. And reliance on human being for correct fair collection has to dispense with. So that also, we did uh, try this in Mumbai uh, uh, and uh, we did succeed. Though there was some human, human intervention at the time of boarding, but there was no conductor in the bus, and that was done for around 1000 buses, it's not like a small number. So, experiments do succeed if you design it properly. So, I think uh, these are some of the issues, um, and I'm there. Thank you. Thank you so much for actually setting the context so well. I think uh, one of the points you touched on, which is very interesting and we want to pick up again in the conversation, is how when we are doing one sort of technology change to give us this, we are also talking about an institutional reform that allows other things like ITMS and automated fare collection, these other technologies to get integrated. And then we are not talking about sort of a linear uh, uh, progression, we are talking about sort of an exponential uh, change and, uh, and how can that be managed, essentially. Uh, 
I'll hand over to my colleague Deeksha Chaudhary to uh, give a brief presentation on uh, some of the institutional and governance frameworks that we are seeing in the e-mobility ecosystem. And then I look forward to uh, picking up the conversation. It's a pleasure for me uh, to be here to discuss about institutional and governance frameworks for subnational e mobility action. Okay, our agenda today is to discuss about how e mobility development is happening in India with a special focus on policy and governance of e mobility at national as well as subnational level. Then we we'll discuss about the challenges in institutional and governance uh, frameworks as well as showcase some best case uh, practices. Talking about India's e-mobility development, uh, India has over 3 million uh, EVs, which is just 1% of total vehicle use as of now. However, the penetration rates have grown uh, uh, quite a bit over the last five years. From 0.71% in 2019, the penetration rate is now 6.5% in 2023. With over 90% share being attributed to electric two-wheelers and three-wheelers. Looking at some policy initi initiatives at the national levels over the last few years, we can see in 2013 itself, a national electric mo uh, mobility mission plan was uh, designed. Then in 2015, FAME 1 scheme was launched. In 2016, provision of EV charging and model uh, building bylaws were announced. In 2019, FAME 2 was, uh, was launched with an outlay of USD 1.2 billion. In 2021, uh, two fuel schemes were announced along with vehicle scraping policy. And in 2023, India became a member of the Mineral Security Partnership and PM EBUS Seva is launched with the Central Financial Assistance of USD 2.4 billion. This is a snapshot of how many departments are involved at the national level to drive AV growth. So we can see that policy formulation and government governance framework is being headed by MOVA and by MOD. Then energy, electricity, power is by Ministry of Power, MNRE. Demand incentives, manufacturing, industrial development is taken care by Ministry of Heavy Industries and Ministry of MSMEs. Then battery recycling, disposal, safety, pollution control is by METI, it's by MOEFCC, Department of Consumer Affairs, CPCB. Standardization of EVs and related components is by DCA, again ARAI. And then innovation and research as well as engagement with stakeholders is being shared with, uh, is being handled by NITI. It has already been discussed, but it's important to discuss NDC TIA here as well. So NDC TIA is a global initiative uh, which brings together government stakeholders in India, Vietnam, and China along with CSOs, academic institutions, and industries together to identify pathways for decarbonization. <coughs> One of the unique aspects of NDCTIA is that the political partner in each country is taking up the ownership of the activities, which helps foster key actions as well as, as, well as encourage peer-to-peer uh, -peer engagements. In India alone, the goal is to accelerate transport decarbonization and EV deployment, and the implementing partner is Niti Aayog. Here, there are two outcomes that are being focused on. Outcome one, stakeholder platform to formulate pathways on decarbonizing transport in India. And outcome two, improved policy and procurement frameworks for EVs and charging infrastructure. Another important example is eFast India. So it's launched by Niti Aayog and it is supported by WRI India. It's one of the country's first platform which is holding collaborations with multiple stakeholders to bring uh, freight electrification. Under this, uh, demand aggregation exercises have been conducted over, and through that we've identified that there are around 8,000, there is a demand of e-free uh, e vehicles of around 8,000. Apart from this, there is also scalable, viable scalable uh, pilots that are being conducted. Okay, from national now, let's move to sub-national States have formulated uh, their EV policies and the parameters have been uh, focused on three key areas, demand side incentives, charging incentives, and supply side incentives. While a lot of states have focused on demand side incentives, especially purchase subsidies and permit incentives, it is also focused on concessional tariff for EV charging. There are very few states as of now who are focusing on supply side uh, incentives 
Those include Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, and Uttar Pradesh. This is here to show that even at the sub-national level, there is a need for interdepartmental coordination because there are a bunch of departments that are involved in uh, driving TV growth in state. Now let's look at some of the challenges which are there in, uh, that are causing the EV ecosystem, they're not causing it, uh, EV ecosystem to grow. For example, here, MOEFCC, there is a lack of coordination between MOEFCC and MHI. While MOEFCC is responsible for regulations for recycling industry, MHI is focusing on industrial development. This lack of coordination is hampering the business activities of the industry, and it's also hindering the promotion of recycling businesses. Similarly, on the other side, when we look at the industry and academia, there is the lack of coordination. So because of the lack of coordination, uh, the real problems of the industries are not getting addressed, and there is non-commercialization of R&D activities. At the charging, there are delays in providing electricity, uh, electricity connection to consumers. We still don't have standard guidelines in uh, each city and state for charging infrastructure in private and semi-public spaces. There is a delay in providing land uh, to CPOs. Also, there is a coordination lag, uh, lagging behind state, cities, and other stakeholders, which is uh, slowing down the EV policy implementation. But, uh, and another uh, thing is uh, the widening skill gap in EV industry, which is due to the lack of engagements between government, academia, and the EV industry. So we have this challenge of reaching 30 by 30, India is a part of 30 at 30 pledge. Uh, to achieve that, we would need 1.2 lakh, uh, one point, there will be an opportunity to create 1.2 lakh more jobs in this sector. So there is a need to overhaul a curriculum to have skilled workforce or EV industry, for which we need greater collaboration between all these stakeholders. However, all is not gloomy. There are some successful examples at each level that are important to be discussed here. As Sir has already mentioned, PM e Seva, which is under the leadership of Mahua, is bringing together a number of stakeholders, both at center and state level. So these include CESL, state governments, public transport authorities, OEMs, manufacturers, financiers, to deploy 10,000 e-buses on PPP model in more than 150, sta uh, 150 cities. And these cities would have, uh, have a minimum uh, formal public transport infrastructure. So PM Eva Seva is striving to achieve harmony in institutional in integration at center, state, and city level with robust support from the industry. At the state level, we have uh, Delhi's government single window initiative that deserves to be uh, mentioned here. So under this initiative, uh, government of NCT created a charging infrastructure working group uh, that, uh, that involves the, the representatives of uh, Department of Transport, Department of Power, municipal corporations, NDMCs, disc firms, uh, Delhi Transfer Limited, EESL. So they've created a single window process to install EV chargers at private and semi-public spaces. It's a one-stop solution for the consumers, and the requests are handled within seven days of uh, when they ask for their uh, request. At the city level, Mumbai EV Cell is leading, and uh, it's being uh, handled by the advisory government stakeholders as well as industry uh, as well as EV experts. The priority actions of Mumbai EV Cell at the city level is to promote charging infrastructure, e bus deployment, fleet electrification. EV financing and battery technology. Moving on to the last case study, we would like to showcase the efforts at uh, bringing carbon neutrality to the UT of Ladakh. The efforts in Ladakh um, highlight the importance of having political will to set ambitious targets and follow through with effective pilots in the high Himalayan region. We have a video with uh, Mr. Amit Sharma, Secretary of Transport, who unfortunately couldn't join us in person speaking to us about electric mobility initiatives in Ladakh. Uh, I'll start from the beginning, please.
So hi everybody. Uh, this is Amit Sharma. I am a significant student of the art and we uh, do portfolios like I am secretary uh, for the rural development and security for trust. So hi everybody. Uh, this is Amit Sharma. I am a secretary in the UG of the art and we uh, the new portfolio finance secretary uh, for the rural development and Hi everybody, uh, this is Amit Sherpa. I am the secretary in the UG of the RAR. I do a different portfolio finance secretary uh, for the rural development and security for transport, security, information technology, science and technology, and master management for the candidate. Apart from this, I am a very sick coach in So, I want to share a perspective that Ladakh is very much uh, inclined and focused towards making it totally carbon uh, neutral duty of the nation as per the vision of our honorable Prime Minister Modi ji. And in that context, we have taken a lot of major initiatives, among us which, while handling transport, I can share with uh, pride and honor that Ladakh would be first duty in the nation by the first among us all European states in the nation, which is going to launch hydrogen fueled buses to be running on the roads of Ladakh. That is, uh, recently we have signed an MOU NTPC in which they have uh, uh, gone under CSR, given us five uh, hydrogen fueled buses, and they have been very much tested and gone through successful trials also in the roads of the terrains of Lata. And now they are under final certifications, which will be done in the next few months. And even they are coming up uh, with a uh, fuel filling station, uh, which is a multi unique station, NTPC station in Kogamsa area in Lake, where uh, these buses will be refueled and at the same time there will be bottling of oxygen, uh, which will be the outcome of H2 as we all know. So this will be obviously for the tourists which will be going in, they can apply this oxygen wherever they go places. So Ladakh is doing some wonderful activities apart from this, we are very conscious about the environment. I have electric vehicles, other city homes which are running on the roads of Lee as well as Kadi both districts out here. And we are uh, ensuring that uh, we, we are the, ha, ha, a no plastic use area. That is, no plastic is being used in our markets if you roam around at the outskirts. So people have become very much conscious and we believe that Ladakh is going to be an ideal carbon market and times to come and our resolve was very, very strong with our uh, honorable president governor, Dr. V. D. Mishra, very much focused towards it as well as our advisor at the board of the world. We are constantly making endeavors to make it totally carbon neutral and we are uh, sure that it will emerge as one of the top carbon neutral places of the nation in the times to come. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Diksha. And uh, I think uh, Mr. Sharma was uh, supposed to join us, but couldn't because of uh, the president's visit to Ladakh, which was uh, decided just earlier this week. So the reason uh, we thought it was important to include his voice is also because uh, there seems to be a correlation between smaller administrations and uh, faster EP uptake also, not just in the case of Delhi, but we see Chandigarh, we see Ladakh, where so many ministries and departments are under. Uh, Mr. Amit Sharma, and that actually leads to some sort of uh, support for group coordination. And uh, while that may not be a uh, correlation that we can statistically prove today, it does seem to have some anecdotal evidence. So just wanted to uh, flag that. Um, getting into the panel discussion, 
Uh, I thought uh, given the sir had uh, set the context that you have said so well, we can start with the conversation on the bus ecosystem as well uh, and uh, and what is being done. Um, so I will start with uh, Mr. Shahzad Alam, the Special Commissioner for uh, Transport in the government of Delhi. Um, Delhi has one of the most ambitious uh, roadmaps for e buses um, uh, with about 8,000 e buses <coughs> that we are expecting in the next few years. How do you see the support of these different mechanisms from the center? And how are you coordinating with different stakeholders, like both from the private sector, operators, OEMs, and different ministries, uh, uh, both within the government of uh, Delhi as well as the central government, to enable this to happen? So, uh, regarding the e-buses, we have a very clear uh, plan. By 2025, we will have 800 e-buses. We have already uh, procured. Eight, sorry, eight, no, we have already have eight hundred uh, at present uh, on the most of them. So, and if, uh, for rest, uh, we have signed the contracts, and uh, the supplier are going to supply in uh, in, in the finished manner, and they will complete it by twenty twenty five. So, as sir was mentioning that uh, that this uh, e buses should not be seen as a replacement uh, for the CNG and the diesel buses, CNG buses. That because, because of this e bus uh, and all the facility which has been provided to the central government, we have been able to achieve the number of buses from this uh, 5,000 buses at present to 11,000 uh, total buses. Out of which 8,000 will be the e bus. One important point on which uh, which sir has highlighted, which I want to uh, mention here, is the tracking of uh, the buses, for which we are clearly uh, defining a dashboard based model, where we are defining a dashboard to track the GPS and to track the service adherence of the buses. So suppose this, this is based on the GCC contract cost model and uh, based on weight leasing. So how much actually the buses? Running on road is will become the will we'll become the basis for the payment, and for that we have already in the mid in the mid phase we have uh, we, we have the GPS in all the um, in the bus which uh, and, and which eventually all the bus which will come, and what we are doing is that we are target, we are uh, tracking the service adherence mechanism using VI tools like click and all. And using the service address, if the bus is running on the exact route which it is supposed to run, then that will be counted as the efficient service. And then that will be counted as, uh, but exactly what Sir has highlighted and exactly the same challenge which we are getting is the lag in the GPS, um, the GPS data. The, clear, the, the, the more cleaner the GPS data will be, the more uh, efficient uh, it will be. But uh, for that, uh, it's, uh, in real time, it may be some lag, but what we are doing is the analysis one day after. So if we will do the one day after analysis, then the GPS data will be more stable. All the GPS data will be stored, and after that, and after that, the analysis will happen. So all, because all these things will become important when it will come to adherence of the contract. Because this is on the day day to day performance. This is the payment link to the uh, means, uh, the supplier, and for this thing, this is very important and in, in that direction which we are. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Adam. I think two points you mentioned. One is how why you are getting eight thousand e buses. You are also going from five thousand to eleven thousand yes. buses. So you are also talking about expanding and electrifying your public transport. And I think one of the key reasons that is feasible today with e-buses is because of the demand aggregation, the aggregated tenders which brought the prices down competitively enough that you can expand at the same time as make your fleet cleaner. So that, that's a very notable point. Um, I would now like to turn to uh, Mr. Pramod Shankar, who is the additional transport commissioner at the transport department and the joint managing director of KSRTC at Kerala. So KSRTC has participated in the NEBP tender, currently looking at the PNE bus SEPA. We are also deploying electric buses with support from KIF, and Smart City and Trivandrum. So how has KSRTC's experience been in working with multiple national and subnational stakeholders to develop the e-bus ecosystem? And uh, how is it different from the procurement and management of IC e bus fleets? Thank you, thank you, sir, and thank you for the organizers for giving the opportunity to present the things in this So, 
So we put uh, yeah, we put Kerala way uh, back in 2018 itself. We started with the uh, EV policy land. So we first time uh, started EV uh, related policy activities. And with we started with an ambitious uh, target of nearly uh, 1 million EV vehicles by 2020. But we do this COVID and pandemic related issues, we wouldn't achieve that. But however, that 1 million, uh, 1 lakh milestone we would be able to achieve. And if I take this uh, statistics of last uh, three months, it's almost 10 percentage of registration going for EV vehicles. The percentation in which short, we are also in, in parallel with that, we are traveling. And because, because of that, so many of uh, these policies are also we launched for EOS subsidy, for the last mile connectivity, field services, and all these things uh, we supported EV ecosystem. While coming to this public transportation, our uh, Kerala State Road Transport Corporation, we uh, initially started this, this is the purchase of 50 uh, e-buses with the aid of a soft loan from uh, Kerala TFP, uh, which is Kerala uh, Financial uh, Corporation. From that, uh, we uh, used that soft loan and purchased some 50 e-buses. And another one more independent, one more autonomous institute we launched, which it, it is called SIFT. Through that, initially we designed some roads and we were earlier running with uh, diesel buses. But there were a number of people who were very less. Initially, seven routes were there. Later on, it is expanded to a total of 11 routes. But we shifted these buses from diesel to electric. Now, then we paid this lease amount to this company from KSRTC for approximately rupees 25 or 25 rupees. Then, followed by that, with the proof of standard, we compared that with the EPKM for 9, 9 meter buses, it is coming nearly 39, and the total cost is almost matched. This is the thing which we did in uh, this uh, Swift e buses with the name of City Circular. Of course, there were some other um, popular measures like ticketing we reduced to rupees 10 for end to end connection. And for uh, 12 hours period, it is just a 30 rupees. And for uh, uh, 24 hours, uh, it's called the good, good day ticket. For that, it is uh, only 50 rupees. They can do unlimited travel. With all these measures, we could be able to enhance the initial passengers of 4,000 per day to 44,000 as of now. So with that, it is matching. Now, as so, uh, of the this initial uh, that uh, context testing, the anxiety over this range, then this battery chemistry, reliability, then opportunity charges, all these things. We, we don't know. This is all our, we, we, we need to correlate with the technology, how the current and the future technologies. Now, for that, the proposal for uh, BM EZEVA and the tenders from CESFP, I will also participate in that. Initial tender also, but, but, but till it is under finalization and uh, uh, we are going to place this B1 down. But then regarding PM is ever, these all anxieties are uh, going to get over. Of course, with the policy uh, of control, we will hopefully we will, we will go to that. And in Kerala's one one speciality is this uh, urban agglomeration. Here, the city to city distance is at least um, 25 to 30 kilometers, whereas on an average in other places it is more than 100, 100, 200, that range. So that, that, that thing I need to uh, get optimized. But of course, I'm sure that this, uh, there's another one point is this automatic fare collection system. Also. Numerous technological uh, uh, things are being addressed and this automatic fare, including that, we placed some orders. And then uh, CVTS with that computerized uh, vehicle tracking system, we are getting, of course, this, uh, this is GPS, that cushioning of some two, three minutes, it is there, that we address. So all these technical uh, innovations are being part of KSRTC and down the line, um, hopefully, with expanding this model to other cities with the help of PMB SEVA type of measures, we can enhance further for a uh, cleaner, uh, greener uh, transportation. Thank you so much, Mr. Pramoch. Uh, I think the swift uh, institutional reform that you instituted is actually very interesting in uh, focusing on buses and uh, bringing it up at its 
it's not just the e buses, but along with that, like you're saying, the fair mechanisms and all of that which you were experimenting with to actually bring it up to scale and make it a viable proposition. So that's very interesting to hear. Um, while we've spoken to the state level on the uh, on the e bus uh, experience, uh, I thought it'd be interesting to hear from CES as well. Uh, which has been working with multiple states, which has been sort of uh, the key intermediary driving the e bus ecosystem for uh, the past couple of years, and is now also working closely with them on the e bus seva scheme. Um, what has been your experience of state institutional capacity and how it has grown in the past couple of years, which are the e buses, with the experiences that states have uh, had? Uh, good afternoon to all, and thanks for having me here. So, uh, I think if you have a little bit brief about the from the process, but the uh, CSA and ESA, and how regulation is helpful uh, in bringing down the cost. We started many of the programs, whether it's an LED bulb program, it's a smart meter program, and now the e-bus also. The aggregation of demand has definitely has bring down the price. And it has helped the, the, the institutions also and the end consumers also. So uh, when we are talking about specifically about the e-buses, the different states have a different kind of requirements. They, they have uh, Many of the states have a city operation, many of the states have a city city operations. Somebody, when we started this one, this exercise and with the, the MHI scheme, the Fame 2 scheme, when we start interacting with the scheme, that some city wants the low floor bus, some cities want, or the, the STUs wants a standard floor bus. Someone requires 40 kilometers square day operation, someone requires 300 kilometers. So, so bringing them all together at a one platform took a lot of uh, interaction with the cities, states, and, and the specifications. And that is how it has been uh, seen the, the success on the pan India basis, where uh, in a tender of, in the first tender of around 5,500 buses, in the second tender of around 6,500 buses, which is more than a half a dozen of the states that the, the investors have been, you know, both the tenders have been participated. So, uh, uh, aggregations always uh, help that one. Uh, and challenges, as we said, the challenges, not much of a challenge, but yes, to bring them to uh, the one platform was, was, was a time taking process to uh, bring them, to make them understand that how it will be helpful. Because uh, they also have a practical challenge. In the cities, you used to learn uh, 110 kilometers, and you say that other cities or the STUs want a 200 uh, kilometer rate of a bus. Then to come down from 200 to get 210, or taking a city from 180 to 200 kilometers, and they on the uh, actual kilometers is, is, a, is a challenge. And uh, some of the cities also, and the STUs also, uh, instead of standard bus, somebody wants a city capacity to be three to two, uh, two door, one door, high floor, low floor. So these are the challenges which we have faced. But now I think we have come over these barriers and now it has seen the success, the initial success, the leading problems are over. And it is all set to scale up in a time to come. I, I, I don't really know. Mm, absolutely. Um, I think that is very fair. And uh, the way the grand challenge of the initial aggregation brought everything together is certainly instrumental in, uh, in the EPAS process to be here just today. Um, I, at this point, sir, I'd actually like to ask you from the PM EPAS perspective. I mean, that was five cities. You're yeah. talking about 169 cities. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about really small cities, cities without organized bus services. Uh, how are you dealing with uh, the vast difference in capacity and requirements of the cities and bringing it together in an aggregation form? I mean, I know it's still in process, but any initial thoughts you may have on that? Cities are, uh, you know, like um, whatever demand we got in, uh, you know, uh, cities are responding. And actually, if you look at the city level uh, information, there is not much variation. There, there are you know few, few kilometers here and there. But I think uh, uh, if you look at the state, uh, there are not uh, there are not much variation. So I think uh, that that is quite useful. And uh, when you put together all of them, even in within the country, uh, state to variation, uh, state to state variation is not that much. So I think uh, uh, you know, like uh, it's easier for manufacturer. Though technically, a manufacturer should be able to do whatever uh, you know, like uh, if you believe 
that cities have a uh, right to provide service, they have also right to demand the right order for uh, the price that they want to pay. So I think, but we did not see uh, a lot of pollution. So I think that's helpful. But we should uh, respect cities' uh, uh, requirement. And uh, so, uh, though I am very much with the cities, but uh, given the fact that lesser variation is actually helpful. Thank you, sir. Um, so now we move to a couple of the other parts of the EV ecosystem as well. So here I'd like to turn to uh, Mr. Kumar Nathan, uh, who's a foreign policy analyst with Guidance Tamil Nadu, which is part of the Industries Department in the Government of Tamil Nadu. So the PN EV policy aims to attract about 50,000 crores of investments in the EV ecosystem, and uh, you're already doing very well on that. Uh, one part of it is the strong automotive industry that is there in Tamil Nadu. But apart from that, uh, I wanted your thoughts on how the guidance is working with various stakeholders to actually create a streamlined process for industries that are coming in for EVs. How are you dealing with the different requirements from the industry's perspective? And how are you creating an attractive uh, uh, ecosystem for industries to come uh, beyond the existing base? Good afternoon to all, and thank you for having a share that I'm uh, guiding this representative in the state of Tamil Nadu. It's uh, an incredible forum on a sustainable and completely for the future. And to kickstart, the guidance has been there, uh, its inception has been there since 1992. Uh, the year when liberalization happened in the country, so they figured out the need of the mechanism to get the, um, to get the investments coming into the state and um, the state, uh, the representative of the bureaucrats and probably the politicians have a vision to have some sort of system in place. And since 1992, that has been there. And uh, as a restructured organization, uh, focusing not just on inward investments, but to go outside and target of our investments coming into the state, we, we restructured for the last five years. In 2018, we restructured us a little bit. Uh, in that way, then, guidance completely uh, you know, elaborated the types of services it was providing. It was just not looking into uh, you know, sitting with uh, investors <coughs> telling out what the state was doing, but we then we focused on ease of doing business. So, uh, we cracked that system uh, uh, quite well. Uh, we jumped around uh, 10 or 15 odd positions where we were, I think, the last, from 18 to 30, I think, and we've been there consistently the top three positions for the last uh, what are the years. And that is one of the key uh, levers that we think, uh, even the development investors identified when they said that we had a, a sort of a survey done with more than 30 large uh, investors in the state. Uh, including a large number of automobile manufacturers. And they pointed out the fact uh, it's not just the subsidies that works in favor for the state, but it's the, the, the first and key most thing is the policy consistency that the state has been able to provide. And the rule of law, and the second most factor is ease of doing business and the port connectivity and the logistics operations. And these are critical for the heavy hitters and players that are in the Moving from there, uh, you know, we have a very dedicated uh, investment promotion scheme uh, focused uh, purely on the auto sector and now in the EV sector, um, which is go getting the, the move across. And uh, in terms of showcasing the state, uh, as I said, beyond the levers that we're looking at, uh, we ensure that there is a lot of interagency coordination effectively happening. So under the ages of the industries department, we have uh, guidance, we have something called SIPCOR, uh, which is the land agency, which is established industrial parks, and we've got FITCO, which is the JV agency, which does uh, it, um, uh, JV in, uh, for the state, and then we've got the investment uh, uh, supporting organization called TIC. Uh, they, they come in for investor uh, subvention and loans and so on. So that coordination is all pretty seamless when it comes to because it's all on the ages of uh, the industry's department, so that is pretty seamless and straightforward. And when it comes to interdepartmental coordination, we are very clear on the two to target in terms of clearances, and that's where the single window program comes in. We've been awarded several times by not just the government of India, but also globally for the single window program and the, the access that it provides a number of clearances. So we have close to more than 140 odd services that are being provided through the single window program of the state. Uh, now, how we're targeting uh, uh, the EV ecosystem specifically and trying to transition towards this. We've now tied the EV ecosystem along with the semiconductor ecosystem in the state. 
and the consumer of Tamil Nadu is uh, recently just back the, the you know the top most exported in terms of electronics in India, and uh, we have a very large electronics uh, EMS clusters across the state. Now we figured that the EV vehicle is not like the ice vehicle. It's not more to do with electronics and electrical than uh, the regular ice vehicle. So we're positioning along with the semiconductor ecosystem so that uh, we are trying to cross track the industries and ensure that there is a lot of value happening across the board. And that's how uh, our investment promotion team or even our policy team where I come in from. Uh, that's how we are trying to target them and group them across. And this has worked in favor of a lot of companies coming in both uh, from the auto sector and from the uh, semiconductor in the electronic sector. Uh, in terms of showcasing where the, the strengths of the state are beyond the regular levers, one thing that has been uh, the, the companies have been looking forward in this era is that uh, what is the ESG, uh, where do you stand in terms of the ESG frameworks? Uh, in, 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 and, and that is where it's and, and Tamil has been leading the nation in terms of uh, the environmental practices that we've been having. And 55% uh, of uh, these states installed capacity in power is from renewable power. And a uh, good majority is in capital power. And we have one of the finest open sources networks, open access networks, where in capital power, third party providers can provide uh, green power to 24 uh, 7 green power to uh, companies in the center, which then provides them access to certifications or green certificates, which they could exchange across the ECTS markets over. <coughs> Other area of position is, is the, the large ecosystem. Now, MSME, which was very strong in the ICE sector, uh, I think that the lab also you know, uh, provide a pat in the back for WI. WI is supporting us in one of the large studies along with Codice, which is an industry body, in the, the just transition of the MSME sector. And in that area, uh, of course, uh, beyond just the capital subsidies and interest advances that we use to provide, uh, we're providing a workforce upskilling mechanism. So we have something called the Apex Skill Development Corporation. We're working with Jika, and the Japanese organization is supporting us. So already Yamaha is already doing that in front of We're getting a few more other bigger players coming in. So we're providing an upskilling workforce up to 10% of an existing workforce in the ICE uh, manufacturing company. They can move towards this. And that's another way how we're showcasing that the MSC ecosystem is also gearing up uh, for the larger ecosystem to come. Uh, one critical other area is, uh, and uh, my uh, Disha was also projecting in the case of the, the strong linkages between R&D, academia, and whatnot. What so uh, we've been working on an industry 4.0 and advanced manufacturing hub. So uh, the, uh, in the upcoming gym, so we had a global investors meet coming up in January 2024. So we'll be launching the first of its time, uh, advanced manufacturing hub with World Economic Forum. And uh, through that, we're developing a portal where it's going to be a discovery tool for any company who comes in to identify what kind of knowledge resources, what kind of R&D labs and facilities uh, that the state has. And in that way, we're showcasing the, the significant R&D strength of the state and the significant R&D expenditure the state is providing uh, into these sectors uh, and, and facilities and whatnot. So, if you're looking at a battery and if you're ensuring that all the, the vehicles running in the country are running safely without exploding, all those facilities are the back in the government. So we have one of the largest energy consortium groups in India working on Viking Madras. And we've been coordinating with them heavily. And uh, what not from Tata to Mahindra to JLA, I have been working with that particular group in ensuring that the batteries that they're using are pretty effective. So we're showcasing the R&D strength of the state effectively. And uh, last but not least, uh, we, we've been in touch with international organizations and countries specifically, and one key area that we'd like to highlight is we've been working a lot with the, the Western Australia and uh, the Northern Territory of Australia. So uh, in terms of the critical windows. So I, I we believe that India is part of the, uh, the mental strategy with the USA, and uh, we, we figured that in our Western Australia and the Northern Territory of Australia are very ahead in terms of the critical minerals. So we are trying to see, apart from what planets can do in terms of getting the critical minerals into the state, we are trying to affect it with any other further mechanism. So these are broadly types of issues. Thank you so much, Mr. Gohan. That's uh, quite a yeah, uh, set of practices the single window portal, the investment promotion scheme, as well as the, the very interesting thing framework that you mentioned and how that is now tying into with many industries and companies having their own next zero pathways and plans. I can see how that can be a real draw in terms of uh, decarbonizing their manufacturing facilities themselves. 
So uh, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I'd like to move to Mr. Mohammad Athar uh, from uh, PwC, who is a uh, partner and uh, leader of CPNI and industrial development at PwC. Uh, so from the uh, counterpoint of that, I think that was already quite an exhaustive <laughs> set of best practices. From a company point of view, um, we are seeing that there is multi there are multiple states that are looking to grab investments in this sector. What are companies looking for and what are some key challenges that uh, states need to address to create that enabling ecosystem to bring EV manufacturing and allied manufacturing to their uh, regions? Sure. So, uh, you know, thanks for having me here and, uh, you know, uh, the advantage uh, firms like us bring is uh, we get an opportunity to work with people like sir uh, at a central government level but we're also working with state governments as well as uh, in regions like Middle East which is also very bullish on uh, electric mobility and then we try to we see a bit of sense so for example let me talk about uh, uh, the demand which is very established uh, uh, for electric mobility but uh, when you could talk to suppliers in our country, they will always give you numbers around 35, 45,000 capacity between all the big uh, electric mobility players that are there against the actual supply that has happened, which is an annual supply if you look for the last two, three years, and, and they will talk about supply chain constraints. Uh, I think that's one big area that needs to be really thought of to say that is battery becoming a challenge or how do we really think about the entire supply chain so that as the states are picking up more demand, are they getting uh, you know enough buses in the time they are you know, looking for? So that's one. Second, if you see, uh, if you think from a private equity mindset, uh, this is a market uh, which is being seen very, very favorably by investors. Uh, but how many candidates do we have right now uh, in our country for more investments to come up? So at the end of the day, 80-90% of the market is still with two, three major players in the electric mobility. Uh, I think for a market like this, diversity of players will become very important and opening to say that can we get much bigger players in this. So that will become, and that's where more capital will flow in, uh, both at an operator level as well as at an OEM level. That diversity will really help the country to scale up. Uh, that That's two. Third, what we are seeing is uh, uh, the manufacturers, because of uh, maybe as the demand is putting up uh, and it's an exciting time for manufacturers to be here. But we are seeing when we work on the state government side, there's a bit of reluctance they have standard products. Now, each city has its own heterogeneity, as Sir was talking about. They're not very keen to change a lot of bus specifications around the safety standards. So, for example, we work with multilaterals like AFW and World Bank and EDB. They will try to push more safety specifications in the buses, but the bus manufacturers will have their own standard uh, you know, specs to say, and they will push back on those things to say, why do we really need it? And then that's where you, know, you start uh, thinking about uh, whether you promote the offtake or you really you know bring in innovation in the way that needs to be done so both from the city heterogeneity side and the supplier ecosystem there needs to be a bit of view on what are our bus spec specifications that's needed so that would be you know really important uh, for our country to really i think the last point i want to make because just uh, we have other speakers uh, on this i think uh, from a city readiness perspective uh, i think as india is a large country uh, around e mobility the, the PM eBus program puts a fantastic perspective towards city mobility of various sizes, so that's fantastic. But uh, because we are talking about a larger public transport, electric mobility, we'll have to also think about intra-city operations and who will pick that up. Will the ASRTU be enabled? And then, and then there's been discussion in Mort on, on some of that. Or also the, the city to rural area, what we call as Mufasil bus services. We have a large set of buses over there. Uh, would that be also covered under e bus seva in future? That would really help the case, and that will be also important. But for that, the planning will need to think about which highways will get electrified, the charging infrastructure around the side amenity. Those are some bits uh, you know, that will really enable investments across. I think you made a very important point. We need a diversity of players, and everybody's trying for that. Now, tell me how to get them here. Did you do have any thoughts on uh, that? And, uh, uh, you know, like how to increase the size of uh, players? Sir, uh, so for example, right now, I don't want to name. Uh, uh, we'll sir, the names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll sir, but, the names. Yeah. Uh, sir uh, but for example, the big operators were really keen on Indian market. Uh, uh, who are running uh, bus services in uh, in US and UK, and then they are keen to explore that, and they have their own tie-ups with OEMs and all, and they are keen to explore uh, a bit of uh, 
uh, market being open. So there are private equity firms which are very well known for enabling bus operations in various markets and they are keen. I can have a separate discussion with you. The, the thing would be uh, whether they would like to come in the current framework of our GCC model or will there be a bit of openness on thinking about that. Uh, that's that's where sir, the, uh, the view would be. Yeah, I think, uh, I think there can be openness in terms of uh, uh, only one thing I think the city would not like to do is to own the bus and run the service. Yeah. Given the, you know, uh, uh, the issues with the uh, this and uh, and with the payment security being a part of the package i think uh, the return on the investment all those issues are yeah so how to get not only the oems but other players who can uh, like in the uk and all that they are bus operators and then they have contract with uh, leasing contract with the manufacturer and all that so i think uh, we can take it offline but uh, we would be keen to work with that on that and then where whatever changes uh, rfp requires uh, we are at very beginning stage we have uh, time during our pre bid and uh, following that so we can address those concerns and uh, widen the market sure thank you thank you um, so that was a little bit on the industrial side and uh, I think uh, what you brought up on the city readiness is quite interesting Mr. Athar and uh, on that actually uh, I do want to talk about charging as well but before that because you brought the link up um, I'd like to turn to Mr. Vijay Saini. Uh, what has been your experience on working with e-mobility projects at the ULP level? And uh, what are some of the learnings on institutional governance reforms required at that level to uh, uh, speed up, accelerate uh, implementation, both in the EVA space but also in the freight space where you've done some work, uh, ecologistic yeah. space, and also, yeah. Thank you, Chaitanya and UMI for giving me the opportunity. So, uh, fantastic. Uh, there has been very dynamic policy landscape across national level, but uh, cities are the forefront where most of the action needs to be articulated, and that is a space where most of the national policy needs to be articulated and localized to accelerate the adoption. We are still targeting the initial demand creation, but now it's a time that we target what has enablers which will be required once the market enters into the self-acceleration mode. So what will be the role of the government apart from initial demarcation, subsidy and everything that's well? Uh, cities needs to come into the picture to provide enabling infrastructure. Now, there has been very limited or little thought process on the mandate of the cities in the entire ecosystem, in the eco ecosystem. And that's also creating a gap between the few of the champion cities, uh, especially the metros and the cities like Surat or other cities who are championing the whole cause and entire ecosystem. Let me give you an example like uh, the cities in Maharashtra and Gujarat are really very active with the policy level innovation where Surat and Ahmedabad has went to the extent of uh, framing local EV policy, which not only give articulation and target, but also they define what the electric mobility needs for them. Like for the Surat, uh, the electric mobility is the avenue to integrate the entire EV technology into the larger sphere of ASI framework which relates to urban mobility and which are the priority segments where they can uh, achieve the decarbonization of transport sectors. For them it's a uh, bus, but also create an institutional gap because the average utilization on the daily basis is much larger than the private vehicles. So once they have defined, so cities can actually find out what are the various sources, maybe building bylaws, but also various uh, local tax and parking tweeting, which can be accommodated within the powers of municipal corporation to create a demand. The city is not only as such said that use of ITMS, so a uh, city has very uh, comprehensive integrated ITMS framework where they are not even integrated automatic fare collection system, but also uh, state of charge of each bus can be monitored from the centralized uh, command and control center and it, it gives them predictability that if certain, what are the dynamic parameters apart from the driving behavior which are impacting the power consumption. So using the data analytics in last one year, they have able to reduce the power consumption per kilometer of bus from 1.2 unit to 1. So that's, again, that's where a city can come into the implementation and achieving the national goals. Apart from them, uh, again, uh, the civil society need to play a very important role to the <coughs> city government in data analytics and how uh, cities can take a more well-defined and informed decision. 
And also, what are the evidence-based uh, policy accreditation required? Because the sector is very dynamic. There's a lot of learning. Not only we are learning, but even the developed countries are uh, learning, not only from the technology, but what are the new innovative deployment models, what are the financial instruments which can be leveraged. Uh, so there's a lot of work which is required to be done at city level from the charging infrastructure, because we are uh, there is a lot of focus on the DC public charging station, but eventually it is well noted fact that more than 65% of charging needs to happen or it, it will happen either at residential area or your work institutions. But that's where uh, not much of the policy or ecosystem level discussion happening. So how we can help city government to take a well-informed decision? Again, once the population on the number of electric vehicle increases in the city, there will be a lot of visible conflict between the uh, public charging station or curbside charge, the charging and the traffic movement. So do we want to enter into a situation where we involve in the fire fighting or we want to prepare city well in advance so that entire transition can happen very smoothly and it doesn't result into the conflict between different people. That's where city can also come to that. Again, uh, uh, let me give you another example like uh, of the public charging station and uh, how the government fleet Initiative can be actually uh, championed by city government. So uh, the city of Kochi, we have very uh, dynamic mayor. So they wanted to lead and showcase the example where a city takes the lead in the electrification of its own street before asking citizens to move toward electric. But then there are a lot of reservation regarding finance, how they are going to uh, put money, finance, everything. So that's where again we help them with the entire feasibility study. We put them a figure that over the next 10 years, what is the schedule, how if the active serving vehicle is going to phase out, and what is the financial impact on the municipal corporation to purchase new vehicle, and what is the PCO of the electric alternative and everything. So and the analysis actually turned out that uh, there will be very little extra money which will be required by the municipal corporation. So it was just a matter of the very articulated evidence fact putting in front of the city government, and that actually translated into take a policy announcement which uh, made them that uh, they are not going to procure any diesel based or uh, internal combustion engine based vehicle here onward uh, for the municipal corporations. So those are the avenues where uh, cities can take their leadership. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vijay. I think uh, some of the points that you highlighted uh, on uh, the role of cities, but also how uh, development agencies can work with cities to build capacity and uh, develop frameworks. And uh, I think actually Kochi is a great example of that because they do work with multiple development partners, and I think GIZ is one of them as well. So uh, maybe turning to deep at this point for a lot on that topic. Uh, I think uh, it could also give some time to. Uh, uh, so, uh, Mr. Kuldeep, so from the energy sector perspective, uh, what are the institutional and governance challenges you are seeing for the deployment of charging and for green charging specifically uh, in uh, in the ecosystem, and uh, how can we scale solved? Anyways, this is not working. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Chaitanya. Um, and thanks, everybody, for allowing the opportunity. Um, we at GIZ, uh, we are uh, kind of taking the integrated approach. And uh, we are not just looking at from the energy perspective, but we are having, let's say, um, uh, different clusters who are looking at the uh, urban mobility. So we have our transport and urban cluster. We have the energy cluster uh, who are uh, trying to uh, tackle the issue of the energy demand. And uh, uh, several speakers have spoken about, for example, uh, we just spoke about ASI approach, spoke about the incentives, also spoke about you know uh, collaborations and, uh, and and let's say integrated approaches and also the communications and role of IT. Uh, but what is lacking is also the RE based EV charging. And NDCTIA is it's, it has been an initiative of, of the German government uh, and uh, with support from our consortium partners such as uh, WRI, Agora, and ICCT. We have been working with uh, Niti Aayog and uh, big thanks to Niti as well for that. Uh, we've been able to identify uh, strategic locations for uh, charging infrastructure across cities, across states. These are simulation-based uh, studies that have been conducted under NDCTIA project. And
and uh, the results are also available in a, a digital library uh, platform where all these studies and reports can be accessed. And apart from that, at the moment, uh, we are uh, working with the state of Goa, we are working with the uh, cities of Bangalore, uh, Kolkata, and uh, uh, also uh, Panaji in Goa, where we are looking at at what locations you can actually come up with the renewable energy installations at the bus depot level. So we are talking about the existing bus depots and we are also talking about the new bus depots and, and you know, uh, formulating a complete net zero pathways for these cities uh, and which can be implemented by the city authorities. And uh, as Vijay also spoke about uh, importance of uh, city governments and authorities, you know, to take the integrated approach and um, having solutions which are, you know, having a basic doing the just transition yeah uh, so there um, uh, I mean we are having the green and Ur urban mobility partnership it's called GUMP in short uh, there we are looking at how you can design cities in a way that you consider the uh, you know uh, the human needs first rather than uh, the urban infrastructure uh, you know taking the priorities so these are some of the initiatives uh, that has been done uh, by NDCTIA I mean uh, given the shortage of time I would not take too much time uh, but I mean we have the digital library and we can share the link as well with the, all the participants available here and you can access all the uh, reports and results and models uh, there as well and uh, we will uh, soon have a national level workshop as well under the NDCTIA project where we will be uh, showcasing our national level modeling exercises for the charging infrastructure and RE based DV charging infrastructure. With that I would take a pause. Um, thank you everybody. Thank you, Kuldeep. Um, I think uh, the value of the digital library in actually building capacity and scaling up learnings uh, is something that should be mentioned. And it's a different sort of mechanism that helps actually uh, support this ecosystem. And uh, and the, on the renewable charging, before I take turn to Jadeep and Sunita, I just wanted to ask, sir, um, with the EV, with the EVA Seva scheme, also looking at supporting the upstream charging infrastructure uh, behind the meter uh, support as well. You know, I was thinking about it. Um, uh, your local uh, uh, RE-based charging versus city level and state level national level. I would like to see the optimization. In the uh, push towards the local RE, are we reaching to serve optimal solutions? So I think that question, I would actually like to see the model. Uh, we also have, uh, we also have a planner, uh, Mr. Ajit Pai is uh, chairman of uh, DOAC uh, and I think uh, uh, he has uh, uh, seen the impact, so I think uh, personal speakers we can also be uh, to put in the Sure, and uh, so turning to Jerry now, uh, Jerry, uh, we, one of the things that Deeksha mentioned has been on the battery and battery circularity ecosystem. Uh, we have the updated battery waste management rules that came in for the EV batteries. Um, but that is at the national level, and we know that a lot of action that needs to happen is at the state level. And there's a lot of infrastructural uh, setting up that needs to happen. So what are, the, what are you seeing as the gaps here and what are you seeing as some actions that states need to take or are taking towards creating that circular battery ecosystem for these? So uh, the mic is on the uh, very good afternoon. This one, this one. I hope I am more. So uh, in terms of the, the areas that we should focus on, uh, there are uh, close to uh, four key things that, that I think we should focus on. The first part that comes to mind is battery tracing and uh, packaging. So the concept of having a battery passport, uh, which is nothing but a standardized uh, document that uh, encompasses information related to environmental impact, origin, manufacturing process, etc. So, uh, and this uh, concept is championed by uh, Global Battery Alliance, uh, which is a PPP uh, model having close to 150 organizations. If something of that sort we can have in India as well, so that will lead to enhanced transparency about the batteries across all the key stakeholders. And I think that is the first thing that we should look at when we talk about uh, battery uh, circularity. 
Uh, the second part and you know the most important part that comes to mind is how we can boost the recycling facilities. So with this uh, battery waste management rule 2022, uh, uh, out of all the uh, state pollution control boards, only UP has given authorizations to recycling facilities. So I think that is something that needs to be expedited at the uh, earliest. And uh, along with that, the other part is how we can uh, boost the support that can be provided to recycling facilities. So uh, there are a lot of schemes that are at the central <coughs> level and the state level that helps, that provides grants, subsidies to uh, EV OEMs, EV component manufacturers. The same thing should be extended to refurbishers and recyclers as well, because they are also doing a very important thing, which is increasing resource security for India and bringing uh, uh, the Indian electricity grid, making making that more reliable. So that is another key thing that we should look at. And the moment we talk about authorization, the next thing that comes to mind is the certification process. So it's important that uh, the material that comes out of those recycling units, we, we are able to certify that based on how pure that material is, at the same time how energy efficient their processes have been and what kind of environmental impact it had. So I think that is another thing that we uh, need to look at. And last but not the least, the, the, the very important point uh, you know, regarding this entire circularity is research and development. So uh, you know, if you talk about uh, various processes that are there in recycling, you, know, you have pyrometallurgical process, hydrometallurgical process, and even in that you have leaching, refining, solvent extraction. There are a lot of processes. And each process can have uh, you know, myriad possibilities to uh, tweak and do that research and innovation. So I think it's very important we provide that support to research and development facilities, uh, ensure there is a creation of center of excellences at ac academic institutions, and how we can have a more enhanced collaboration between industry and government. That is something that we need to look at. With that, I'll stop. Thanks so much, Adeep. Um, I think on the battery tracing and testing, when you're talking about the need for enhanced uh, the battery passport, but also enhanced testing facilities, given how much more testing is expected to happen with EVs, um, the refurbishers, I wonder if that is an issue of battery recycling coming under MOEFCC, whereas all the other industries and you know manufacturing happens under the industries departments, and whether that is actually a you know um, example of uh, uh, a siloed uh, approach. Um, and that's that's actually a very good point. So uh, so thank you for those. Um, and on the uh, again before uh, we come to Mr. Ajit Bhai, Dr. Sunita, um, uh, who is a researcher from ICCT. Uh, Dr. Sunita, you've been hearing all of the different uh, sort of uh, uh, areas of uh, institutional coordination needed and some of the examples. So from your perspective, what is the role of civil society organizations and research organizations to support this, be it at a national level or subnational and local level? At the national level, we've seen the NECTI platform, the local level, which I spoke about some of the examples. If you could speak to what you see as the key role of uh, development partners and civil society organizations in uh, accelerating this ecosystem. Yeah, thanks Chaitanya and good afternoon everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, so it is great to hear uh, some of the key points because uh, Dr. Bagde has already mentioned that the technical requirements uh, need to be addressed in the existing government framework. So that is an area where we should understand the development happening and it is already happening in the, in the conversation levels where civil society organizations are playing an important role, but they can also play a larger goal in promoting the global uh, public good. So in the um, in promoting these, for example, e electric mobility, two key things that we should uh, understand. One is they continue to be an active partner in the development. And second is promotion of transparency. Uh, so for example, in uh, being continued to be in the, um, be in the active partner means um, how do we increase the, uh, the, the fundamental point 
point of increasing the EV sales. So that would have setting public uh, zero emission vehicle target and uh, that is nothing but investment in zero emission vehicles. So uh, this is seen in the back front as the absence of government uh, policies and that is seen in uh, some of the major markets across the world how that has been developed in the form of incentives in the fiscal as well as non fiscal incentives and how the regulations have part in place uh, of all this. So the civil society uh, organizations and through research should continue to become active partners and become a bridge of uh, how this conversation taking place and with an important element of transparency where how the data-based evidence uh, research would bring into picture uh, the clarity to the decision maker and uh, how that conversation can be taken forward. Thanks so much, Dr. Um, and Mr. Adipai, if you could uh, provide your remarks on uh, what we've been discussing. Yeah, good afternoon. I'll just ask a couple of questions actually to this group from one very specific perspective, and that's when you're looking at the built environment and looking at standards. So I think we've already raised uh, the question, uh, I think more than one speaker has raised the question of configurations, multiple configurations, reducing them, and that definitely impacts the way that all the design uh, for these buses or whether it's any kind of vehicle uh, would adapt for city standards for how things will go over there. The second is, I think we still don't have a complete consensus on what the charging infrastructure is going to look like in terms of standards. So most of it is now going to be retrofit on even new buildings that are coming up. So we don't have a standard you know, for two-wheelers, three-wheelers, four-wheelers, and buses. Uh, we still haven't decided what the specific standard will be for all of them together, where it's going to be separate. And there's not enough research that's around it for the Indian context. I think some countries have already decided. So like bus would have a very different infrastructure from two-wheelers. But a lot of that standardization, once it has, uh, you know, starts getting decided across states, across cities, uh, then you start generating uh, what I would call critical mass uh, for scale uh, and bring down the economics, bring down the ease of adoption in these areas. So both of those are very relevant to uh, being able to get buildings that are coming up today. Uh, ready to accept, future ready to accept all the vehicles that are coming up. And more than the buildings that are coming up today, the public infrastructure, the flexibility of public infrastructure uh, to sort of address that. So I think those are the two points that I would make in this particular context. Thank you so much. Uh, so you have. I think uh, what he was saying is really relevant. Uh, the, Mr. Saini. He was saying, uh, you know, like this uh, public charging infrastructure where everybody wants to. You like to have many, uh, in many of the spheres, you like to think we should have been done at home, outside. You know, like throwing so our know, garbage outside. Uh, <laughs> so maybe we want to charge our vehicles in the public charging infrastructure, assuming that there is some gain. It will all lead to chaos there rather than charging the vehicle like this. Mr. Pai, thank you very much. I didn't realize that you will raise the issue which are very pertinent to our own functioning. I also happen to be a member of the committee in which we implemented the building design and all that. But I think we should have a separate discussion on this how the individual buildings and institutions can play a role in mitigating uh, these issues. If uh, Mr. Saini and all that, if we can have. I'm ready that uh, uh, Delhi takes a lead uh, with Mr. Pai being at the forefront. And then we organize. I think this issue has not been, we always say that public infrastructure. But what can be done at home? Why do we need to export uh, the problems? Why can't we solve the problem at home? So I think this uh, issue appears to be very important. Uh, and I think this forum, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, rather, uh, my colleague Jaydeep is also there. In uh, next urban mobility uh, conferences, creating charging infrastructure balance between public and private, yeah. I think that should be the key because we just can't do everything in uh, public. Absolutely, sir. That's a whole uh, different. Yeah, I think that's very interesting topic. I'm here to rely on that. I think it's in home actually the main issue is the parking. So because in Delhi we have target of 20,000 bar charging station points, but uh, we have actually only 1,620 private parking points. And one main reason I see in this is it's not the cost because the cost is 6,000 the Delhi government is already giving. <laughs> they have to pay only 2,500. 
and it is very easy to means there is in the window button. But the major point is the main problem is the space where where the, where people are parking their uh, their car, and that is that is one. So that for that one possibility there are those residential complexes which have the internal parking uh, space. Yeah. Those could be the first point where we should target. On the Delhi government, where uh, we are working right now, is the focusing on this uh, government building. All the government buildings, all inside the there, there is some space for parking. Be it the secretariat or be it the transport department office or elsewhere. All kind of such offices we are not focusing because this is the low hanging fruit which is in our capability to achieve. But uh, exactly the private home, the parking space is the one problem, and the half of your money is. Okay, but if you have standards developed here, then uh, when building some far poor, we say that in case point is, yes. and uh, give us the scheme how we are going to design. And once we uh, formalize this, you know, like uh, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, not only that we deal with the mobility, but we have several other uh, departments. So through uh, advisory on building bylaws, I can advise uh, other states. But the point is going to show that it can work. And it's not only government uh, space. See, I have to park vehicles in night somewhere. And when I go out of my Dimotiva place, uh, I see on the curb side of the charge. The charging can happen in the night also. So when it's at home, uh, you know, your muscle tooth and all that, I think maybe there are many concerns. You do not have the other side's perspective. Issue of safety. People may be worried that this charger might blow up in the night. You know, all those uh, things uh, are there. Uh, so I think we need to have a discussion with the people who are having the parking space, but at the same time not charging the vehicle. And I think then we can have a uh, right uh, 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 institutionalized. We already have a uh, Various ways of doing it. Yeah, Just the submission. Sir. So, City of Rajkot and Surat are already working on the guidelines for the retrofits as well as the uh, upcoming building, which plans to be incorporated as part of the building by those approval process and in, will be integrated as part of the DCR. So, uh, they have like categorization of buildings and what is the infrastructure requirement for the building to be EV enabled, EV ready, and across and based on the different sizes, if it's a small size project or large uh, size or based on the heights and what in which are density able to the building is located. But uh, in Mohawk, will you take the lead on this, sir? Yeah. Because uh, the model building bylaws were already amended yeah. by Mohawk. See, why, why division does model building bylaws come in? And we have a chairman of the committee, uh, I'm a member of that committee, who is the building. So, uh, but uh, you know, like uh, the issue of how to do it, there are technology issues, there are uh, things. And I think uh, just we can't rely on the government. It's going to include the traffic gaps. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. building measures are being passed in an ad hoc manner, but I think translating them on ground also is it's becoming good. a challenge. So, uh, if there's a great work for Mahua if you're willing, if you're able to do PM Mimas and that, sir. We do everything. What to come Thank you. Um, so, Thank you all. I think uh, we are at time. We have gone a little over. We started a little late. But uh, that was a very enriching conversation. I won't uh, put together any closing remarks per se, but we will be sharing a short summary of this with all the speakers and uh, um, participants. Uh, thank you for your time and your insights. And uh, yeah, uh, close the session. Can the speakers stay back for a short group photo? एक सेकंड लाइट ऑन कर दीजिए भाई आराम से वेट सर वेट वेट मैम आप फ्रेम में आ रहे हैं 
एक्सक्यूज मी ठीक है डन सही है ठीक है तुमने चलो तो मेरे ख्याल से 